Let us be conscious, my dear friends, of God's mercies towards us, which we experience in abundance and move forward in life with courage, doing our work which God has entrusted to us faithfully. Let us look at the realities of life and accept as they are, <coughs> and adjust ourselves to the new realities or the new normal, as we often use the terminology now, instead of complaining about it or even questioning God about it. Life, which is a precious gift of God, has to go on despite all odds, and this will be possible only when we realize that God is with us, as we reaffirmed again during Christmas. <coughs> the greatest sign of God being with us is when we try to build up our colleague or our neighbor instead of destroying him or her. Let us be more understanding, cooperative and caring in the new year and thus contribute towards making your lives more meaningful. We have tried to read through the book of Revelation, I'm sure many times, or no time, some people hate reading the book of Revelation. In fact, Martin Luther, the great reformer, said Revelation is worthless. Now, those of us who have tried to read the book of Revelation, and who have attempted to study the book of Revelation have only more questions than answers. All of us have been deeply confused by the deep symbolism and imageries that makes it seem impossible to understand exactly what the author was trying to say. When you study the book of Revelation, from a biblical point of view. There have been different attempts to try to understand the book of Revelation. In fact, one of our guest speakers last year, Dr. Santakumari Sundar, IAS, she has been a person who has been trying to understand the Bible in a simple way, make it simple for the ordinary readers in the church. And the second book which she gifted me with last year was entitled Revelation Made Easy. So there are people who try to read the book of Revelation and try to understand the book of Revelation and try to make it easy for the common reader. But as all of us know, the book of Revelation is a book which has been terribly abused and misinterpreted and misunderstood for their own ends, for their, for their own agenda. And therefore, I would not be surprised if we have more questions than answers when we read the book of Revelation. As I said, as a student of the Bible, or as students of the Bible, all of us are. There have been different schools of thought in reading the, this book of Revelation, in trying to understand this book of Revelation. The first view is what is called the idealist view or the spiritual view. Now this view uses allegorical method to understand the message of the book of Revelation. According to this view, Revelation or the events of Revelation are not tied to specific historic events. The imagery of the book symbolically presents the ongoing struggle throughout ages of God against Satan and good against evil. But then in the end, God is victorious and God's sovereignty is displayed 
throughout the ages. So that is the first view in biblical scholarship and interpretation, the idealist view or the spiritual view as they call it. There is a very second, very interesting school of interpretation, a second interpretation called the preterist view. Preterist view. Preterist, the term preterist means of the past, of what has happened in the past. Now this has been made popular by, the, by a Catholic, Roman Catholic priest, and he has held the view that all what has been prophesied in the book of Revelation has already taken place. Now, according to the preterist view, it is addressed to the church, <coughs> which was under threat from the Jews as well as from the Roman Empire for a long time till Constantine became Christian. And therefore, this book of Revelation is addressed to the early church or to the church which is better under persecution by the Roman Empire, encouraging them to hold on, telling them, I am making everything new. Now, according to this preterist view, it has nothing to do with us. It doesn't speak to us, but rather, it has already happened. What has been said in the book of Revelation has already happened. And this has been advocated by the, a Catholic priest by name al -Kazer. Now there is a very interesting third viewpoint which has been attempted to understand the book of Revelation and that is called the futurist view. The futurist view. The first, the idealist view. The second, preterist view. And the third, the futurist view. Now this method of interpretation also has been propagated or propounded by a Roman Catholic priest. And he holds the opposite view, that the periods or the events which is written in the book of Revelation are periods in the life of the church from the end of the first century and extending to the end of time. In other words, what he says is, it is not simply a book which records events which have happened in the past, but it has to do with the end of time, till the end of time. But then the problem with this historicist view is, according to the understanding of the Catholic priest by name Rivulia, and this school of thought, the book of Revelation has been primarily composed or primarily to be understood as a book which has got events which have been fulfilled between the first and from the first century to the end of time. And this theme or this method has been basically propounded mainly because as all of us know, maybe some of us would have heard sermons that are being preached from the book of Revelation saying that the Antichrist, which is mentioned in the book of Revelation, stands for papacy, the Pope. And the Catholic priest by name Alberia, or Iberia, or his followers could not accept this fact that the Antichrist mentioned in the book of Revelation talks about the Pope or the papacy. And therefore, he propounded this view called the futurist view, saying that it has to do with the future, not with the present, not with the papacy or with the Pope, but rather 
This has to do with the future. But then there was another problem with this futurist view. Now these people who have propounded this futurist view have a limited understanding of the future. For them, the future was immediate. Not 2000 years after, it was immediate. Something to happen immediately. And this is, has been another view which has been propounded in the history of biblical interpretation, a futurist view. Now the fourth view is still important. That is what is called the historicist view. The historicist view. And this view, and according to this interpretation, Book of Revelation is being fulfilled between the first and the second coming of Christ. It is being fulfilled. All what is happening today and all what has happened since the beginning, since the coming of Christ, is what is recorded in the book of Revelation. It's history, in other words. It's not just imageries and symbols. It is symbols and imageries. But then once you try to understand the symbols and imageries, you try to understand the historical input inherent in symbols and imageries in the book of Revelation. And therefore, there have been attempts to look at the book of Revelation from a historicist point of view. Let me repeat, the idealist view, the preterist view, the futurist view, the historicist view. And finally, there has been also another school of interpretation. And that is what is called the canonical view or the theological view. Now this view, the canonical view or the theological view, holds that the book of Revelation has gone through the process of canonization by the church, by the councils of the church. And therefore, the book of Revelation, which is, at the, which is the end of the New Testament, not only the end of the New Testament, but the end of the Bible itself, cannot be simply ignored. It's a part of the canon. It's a canonized book, and therefore it cannot be simply thrown, up, thrown off, thrown away. It has to be understood. Attempts have to be made to understand the book of Revelation. And they hold the view that this book has to be treated with respect, like you treat other books in the Bible. Now, my task today is not to discuss these views in detail, the idealist view or the preterist view or the futurist view or the historicist view or the canonical view, but rather to remind us that the Revelation is a book which is rich in meaning. And it is important to order our lives according to the revealed truth which is inherent in it. In my own study of the book of Revelation, I tend to prefer to offer the canonical or theological point of view. Mainly because for me, canonization process is significant. So many have spent quite a lot of time in this canonization process. Dr. Jonathan and my other colleagues in the Department of Translation would tell us how much of time they spend in bringing out a text. Similarly, canonization has been a process which has been involved by the church over the years in taking, in studying these books and understanding the validity of these books. And in that process, the book of Revelation has been canonized and it has got into our Bibles. And therefore, because of the significance of canonization by the church, we cannot ignore or throw away the book of Revelation simply because of the symbols and the images which are in it. Now, the other reason why I prefer a theological view of the book of Revelation is important. It's mainly because 
For me, if you ask me, what is the Bible? I will not say it is history, but rather I will say it is a theological statement. That is what the Bible is for me. It's a theological statement. It's a statement of theology as to how humans have understood God and God's actions in the present, in the past, in the present, and in the future. And therefore, I'm trying to attempt to read this book of Revelation, particularly Revelation chapter, this particular verse, Behold, behold, I will make all things new. Revelation chapter 21, verse 5, from a canonical or from a theological point of view. In fact, verses 1 to 8. Now, as all of us know and all of us have heard the text read now, St. John is given a new a vision of a new heaven and a new earth. And he also sees a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And then he hears his words, Behold, I'm making all things new. Revelation chapter 21 verse 5, which is the theme for our service this morning and for this reflection. Our text begins with John letting us on in on the vision of the Lord gave him. What does he write? He writes like this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the earth had passed away. And it's one of the first statements that he makes. A new heaven and a new earth. But the question is, what was so wrong with the first heaven and the first earth? Why do they need to pass away? After all, in Genesis chapter 1, it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And God saw all that he had made. And it was very good. Now, my dear friends, to be sure, there are still many good things about this creation that we live in. Beautiful sunsets, birds singing, lovely trees around us, flowers, music, children, grandchildren, the marvelous abilities of the human mind. These are all good things, and they give, they give us joy. So the heaven and the earth in which we still live bear the stamp of the goodness of God. But at the same time, there is much about this created order that is no longer good. The COVID-19 pandemic and its mutations or variants devastated and continue to devastate all our hopes and aspirations. Nature is not working right. We humans are not working right. Cancer destroys the body. Alzheimer's disease fogs the mind. People commit deeds of unspeakable evil. Death and disaster, heartache and sorrow, plague heaven and earth as we now stand in. The powerful victimizes the powerless. The just become unjust. Corruption becomes the order of the day in all spheres of life, including the church, which envisions a new world order marked by equality and dignity of all. So what has happened in a world we use the common terminology we often use, sin. As for the scripture, sin entered this world when our first parents doubted God's word and turned against God. And all the children, that's us, have been sinning ever since. As a result, the earth itself came under a curse. The whole creation is out of whack. Things don't work the way they're supposed to. 
death and decay surround us. We are passing away, and one day this world will pass away. St. Paul puts it like this in Romans chapter 8. Creation was subjected to frustration. That is what he says. Creation was subjected to frustration. The whole creation had been groaning. But then Paul also says, one day, the creation itself will be liberated from bondage, from, this, from its bondage to decay. In the meantime, the creation awaits in eager expectation for that day. So a new day is coming, it's going to dawn. And that is what St. John is given a glimpse of here in the book of Revelation. A new heaven and a new earth. God will remove all the bad stuff from this first and fallen creation. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, or nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Out with the old, in with the new. Out with sin and all its damaging effects. Disease, death, no more. Fighting and fears, troubles and tears, no more. All these belong to the older things, and they are not, they are on their way out. Things like fellowship with God, something we know now, but then our fellowship with God will be perfect, undisturbed by any sin, all things new. Things like bearing the people of God gathered in his presence, something we are now, but when it will be fulfilled, to the greatest possible degree. In that day, we will hear a loud voice proclaiming the consummation of the ancient covenant promise. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with the human. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself, or God's self, will be with them as their God. Our Lord gives us God's word on this. He says, Behold, I am making all things new. Now here I want you to listen very carefully. John does not say I am making all things new. He does not say I am making all things new or I am making all new things. It is not like God is going to annihilate everything and everyone so that they bear no resemblance to their current state. That is not what John is saying. There will be some continuity. You will be still you. I will be still me. There will still be some sort of a heaven and an earth. A new heaven and a new earth. Now the Greeks, in the Greek language, they had two words for new. The word new. Kainos means absolutely new, fresh, new in time, which has recently come into existence, which did not exist in the past. Completely new, absolutely new, new in time, perfect, Kainos. But that is not the word that is used here. Instead, the word which is used here is neos. And this Greek word neos has the connotation of renewal, the idea of renewal, a new quality that exceeds the old, a new quality that exceeds the old, renewed creation. And therefore a new heaven and a new world, meaning a renewed heaven and earth, a new kind of heaven and earth which is renewed. So it will not be all new things, but rather all things new, made new, renewed and restored to a more glorious state. So John sees a new heaven and a new earth. What else does he see? He sees a new Jerusalem. This is 
what he says. I saw the holy city in New Jerusalem. The holy city. Large enough to be home to all peoples of the earth who will live there. A community where people will live together. A beautiful place where God, the humans, and the nature will dwell together in peace and harmony. That is the concept of Jerusalem. But why Jerusalem? Why is it that Jerusalem is coming down from heaven? As all of us know, the name Jerusalem means city of peace. And historically, even till today, it is, a, it is not a city of peace. And we doubt very much Jerusalem is any longer or any more a city of peace. For over centuries, Jerusalem today is the tense and overcrowded home to several political, religious, and ethnic factions. Even in biblical history, Jerusalem was far from being an ideal city. David, Solomon, and other kings who ruled there did not always rule wisely. Jerusalem was a city that stoned the prophets and killed those sent to her. Jesus wept over Jerusalem, you may remember, knowing that God's judgment would come upon it. But there was also something about the city that made it holy. Because Jerusalem was where God chose to make dwelling on, earth, on the earth. The temple was in Jerusalem, which is regarded as the place of God's presence, the place where God provided for sacrifices to be made to atone for sin. Those sacrifices pointed ahead to the final sacrifice made by the Son of God himself. On the cross, Jesus Christ offered his own life for the sins of the world. Jesus died there in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, our redemption was won. So please notice what John says about the new Jerusalem. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. This tells us that God is the source of our redemption. The New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven from God. Just as Christ himself came down from heaven for us humans and for our salvation. And because this happened, we are part of the Holy Christian Church, the people of God who live forever in the New Jerusalem as the glorious church triumphant. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Again, the words of John. The church is the bride of Christ. And St. Paul uses this husband and wife imagery in Ephesians chapter 5. He says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or blemish, but holy and blameless. We, the church, are the bride of Christ. We will enjoy the closest communion and the most intimate fellowship with our Lord for eternity. In holy baptism, Christ has prepared us by cleansing us from our sins. Now we are the people of God, the new people of God, the radiant bride, bride of Christ. And we await the coming of heaven on earth in the new Jerusalem. In 2 Corinthians we read, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You and I who are baptized Christians, we, have all, we are already fitted out for this new heaven and the new earth because we ourselves are a new creation. Baptized into Christ, we are citizens of the new Jerusalem. The contrast between heaven and earth disappears in the new creation. It's very interesting to note this. That is why I said we should not throw away the book of Revelation. There is something deeper and theological which we need to learn. 
the contrast between heaven and earth disappears in the new creation. Now the tabernacle of God is with the human, men, women, children, physically challenged, visually challenged, people of other gender, and so on. All shall be God's people. Chapter 21, verse 3. This new creation and that new creation is not merely something to look forward to. In Christ, there is already the possibility in the power of God's Spirit to bring about that new creation in our own lives today. The new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem are not at all an eschatological miracle as many preach today. Something to happen eschatologically. It can happen now. In Revelation 21, the fact that the names of the apostles are written on the foundations of the world and that the kings of the earth bring their glory into the city suggest that humans do contribute to its distinctive character. Human agents infused with the spirit of the new creation contribute to the future reign of God here and now in the midst of all the debris of the old world. John's vision my dear friends, it's of a communal society. A reminder that the biblical practice and hope center around humanity's relationship with God and with one another. Christianity, sad to say, has in its history focused so, so often on hope for the individual that it sometimes has lost sight of the central place, community place in the past present and future expressions of human destiny. There will be no temple in the New Jerusalem. Have you noticed it in your study? There will, not be, no, there will be no temple in New Jerusalem. Why? Because the glory of God will pervade the whole city. Throughout the New Testament, sacred buildings seem to be of little concern to the writers. What is important is the reign of God. Emmanuel, God with us, Matthew 123, is not housed in the building, but is met in the persons of the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, and the imprisoned. Heaven and earth no longer meet in tabernacle or temple, but outside the camp. But outside the camp. And that is something which we need to understand very, very clearly. A place of shame and reproach. God's love and solidarity are among human beings in ways that elaborate performance of cultic ritual never can be. That is where we need to see God's love and solidarity. Not in the cult and in our worship, but outside the camp, where there is shame and reproach. Revelation 21, 1 to 7 are frequently read at funerals. We ordain clergy. We often read this text when we go and attend a funeral service. And the main purpose we do this is in order to comfort the bereaved. But when you read this book of Revelation from the whole book point of view, or from the whole biblical point of view, reducing the meaning of Revelation merely to a message of comfort is an escape or a betrayal of the prophecy of the Apocalypse that is not so much with the relief that everything will turn out well. Now, the prophecy of Apocalypse is there to console, but also to challenge and warn. And this is something which we seldom emphasize. We read this passage mainly to comfort the bereaved. But along with consolation and comfort, there's also the challenge and the warning by the apocalyptic writer. The vision of John confronts us not so much with the relief that everything will turn out well in the end. But with the reality that things here and now 
a profoundly unwell, a profoundly unwell, and that repentance and change of life are required from each of us. The promise of a new heaven and a new earth is a vision of judgment on the culture of death, where money and privilege can buy success, health, and care, and the dignity and the well-being of people are subordinated to the demands of economic accounting and ability to pay. I do not have to explain. <laughs> I've come across people who have been affected with COVID-19, shelling out, borrowing money from their neighbors, finding it difficult to pay the hospital bills, and how the hospitals have looted the patients who have been already suffering. And therefore, the promise of a new heaven and a new world and a new Jerusalem is a vision of judgment on the culture of debt according to me. The dignity and the well-being of people are subordinated to the demands of economic accounting and their ability to pay. My dear friends, the text for our reflection this morning and for this new year ahead is, Behold, I'm making all things new. As I said, new means not completely new, renewed. The new has already come. In other words, the possibility for this renewal has, is already there and has already come. The newness of Christ has already come into your life. And yet, the new is still coming. Is on the way and we look forward to it. The old world is passing away, but behold, there's the whole new world, a renewed world coming. All of us can count on it because our Lord Himself has given us God's word. Behold, I'm making all things new. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.